Hello, my dear colleagues. Welcome to another Inget Zoom Serious Talk. And today our guest is Thiago Vaz. Thiago Vaz is an English teacher with 24 years of varied cl classroom and school administrative experience in Brazil. He works for the Federal Institute of Alagoas. He has a BA in languages, Portuguese and English, and MA in applied linguistics, and a specialization in school management. In March uh, 2024, Tiago was awarded an exchange program on trauma-informed teaching by the U.S. Department of State through RILO Brazil. The title of uh, my dear colleague's talk this evening is Practical Activities to Incorporate Social Emotional Learning in English Lessons. I believe it's where we're going to benefit from this talk a lot. We will learn a lot. Uh, thank you, dear Thiago, for being with us, for accepting to be our guest speaker, and welcome again. The screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Aydan, and everyone that is present in this uh, webinar. I'm super honored to be able to speak to Turkish teachers, and I would like to greet you all and say good evening, <laughs> as you were already in the evening in Brazil, it's 2.30 p.m., but if you're in a place that it's 2 in the morning, good morning. <laughs> Let's get started. This is the title of my presentation, Practical Activities to Incorporate Social and Emotional Learning in English Lessons. I came up with this title and this topic. Of course, first of all, I have to thank you for the invitation, Ida. Um, it, uh, I felt surprised and at the same time uh, felt a huge responsibility to bring quality content for you all here. I searched about your channel and your association and there is nothing like it in Brazil. So uh, I believe we can even talk further about this and bring something uh, for us here in uh, such complexity and that brings teachers together and uh, shares knowledge. I work for the Federal Institute of Alagoas here in Brazil and I'm going to give you a quick context about my place and my job before I start my presentation. Here there, there is a map, a simplified map of Brazil. In Brazil, there are 26 states and one federal district. I live here in Pernambuco and I work in Alagoas. So I work in the different states that I live. It's about 380 kilometers from my house. So it's a six hour drive for me to go to work. I drive, I drive 12 hours every week, so I, tra uh, I travel every Tuesday and come back home every Friday. So. Today, after this webinar, I'll come home to my wife and my daughter. <laughs> and they're online there waiting for me. I'm talking about the Brazilian states because I'm going to talk about the federal institutes. I don't know if there is anything similar in Turkey, in uh, Turkey, I'm sorry, but a uh, federal institute is a set of schools, of public national schools that teach technical courses and high school. So there are 38 federal institutes in Brazil. These 38 federal institutes are divided into the 26 states. So each state has a federal institute and some states have more than one institute. And in each institute, there are several campi. So there are 656 campi around Brazil. And I work in one of them. <laughs> and they are spread in 590 different municipalities. So there are more than almost 600 cities that are benefited by these structures that bring technical courses, high school, and some of them um, undergraduate programs and even graduate programs. 
for Brazilian students free of charge. And this is the place I work. I work for the Federal Institute of Alagoas, as I've already mentioned. Here in this state, there are 16 different campi. And I work here in this campus called Santana do Ipanema, which is in the countryside of the state. As we go back to the Brazilian map, you will see that Alagoas is one of the smallest states in Brazil, with this tiny one here. <laughs> And there are 16 federal schools here, so I'm really proud of that and to be uh, also proud to be able to work for these um, lovely students that are here. And I work in the countryside of one of the smallest states in Brazil. And you might be thinking, why am I giving you this context? It's because I've been doing some volunteer work for the American Embassy in Brazil. I started to know about their projects and I started to join their pro projects and doing their courses. And they knew about my job and appreciated what I was doing here in the countryside of Alagoas. As a result of my job, I was awarded an exchange program to the United States by the US Department of State. And I met 10 super talented teachers from different countries and two super talented teachers from Turkey, Volkan and Mirei. I would like to greet them specially. They were super friendly to me and we all had a great time together. So all of them are really special when we continue in a network of learning after this exchange program. It was only 15 days, so it was in March this year that we went to the United States and we learned so much. The theme of our exchange program was trauma-informed design in education. So there is everything to do with social-emotional learning. During the exchange program, we went to the TESO event that, you know, is the biggest English teaching convention in the world. It was in Tampa, Florida, and we were gifted with these uh, uh, pass for the event, and we could watch so many interesting presentations. But this one was the one that was a highlight for me from teachers Javier Herrera and Hilda Martinez Alba. They were presenting um, something related to this book that is called Social Emotional Learning in the English Language Classroom. And of course, I bought the book. And this is a picture of my book that is right here with me. I take it with me everywhere. And I'm always reading a passage. It's super easy to read and with practical activities that will help you bring social and emotional learning to your English classes. I realized that many things I did in my classes were social and emotional practices. So I was doing my work and feeling that I had to do I had to work that way with my students and with this trip to the United States, I could have the theoretical background to enrich my work practice and to improve my productivity and to bring even higher quality social and emotional practices to my students. And I'm here to share some of them with you. I also have to mention Dr. Yagmur's uh, webinar. It's called The Benefits of Social and Emotional Learning Competencies for L2 English Teachers. This webinar is amazing. I advise everyone to watch it before this webinar or after this webinar, you can watch it because she brings all the theoretical background related to social and emotional learning. And my presentation has as objective to make a dialogue with her presentation. I watched her presentation and I was 
amazed that she brought many elements that are in this book that I've just mentioned, and she brought even more information. So it's um, truly enriching uh, theoretical background for us English teachers. And here I'm bringing practical activities to make this dialogue with her presentation. So let's start with a question, quick question, maybe 10 seconds for them to answer. Dr. Aidan, is it possible? <laughs> the question is, what is social emotional learning? Share your thoughts in the chat box. You can share a word, you can share a sentence, something that comes to your mind when you think about social emotional learning. I can see the chat box here. Student involvement, yes. Teacher-centered practices are connected with social emotional practices. Let me show you what I have here. This is a quick theoretical background from the book I've mentioned, from Dr. Ehera and Martinez Alba. These are examples of social and emotional learning uh, aspects. Recognize and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, appreciate the perspective of others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, make responsible decisions, and handle personal and interpersonal situations constructively. Can we picture a, a situation in school that any of these aspects occur? I believe so. I can think of even more than one situation when each of these aspects are related. And that's why it's so important to study and include social and emotional practices in our English classes. I also have to talk about social and emotional learning core competencies because they are the roots, the structure, the base of social and emotional learning. And with this book, I learned we, I learned that we have to connect a core competency with the activities we are doing in class. These are the five social and emotional learning core competencies. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skill, responsible decision-making. So I wrote a note there, associate each social and emotional learning activity you do in class with a core competency. I believe they are self-explainable, but if you would like to have a deeper understanding of these concepts, you should definitely um, watch Dr. Yagmur's uh, webinar and you will be better informed. You now let's talk about the social and emotional learning practical activities I have for you. I listed seven activities, but I could bring 10, 20, 50. <laughs> I could spend many days sharing practices with you. In the end of the presentation, by the way, I'm going to share my email with you and I can share with you this visual presentation and we can discuss further about this topic. The first activity I'm going to share with you is, it's not an activity, it's a practice. Learn your students' names. The second one, mindfulness practices. Three, the third one, social emotional quote. 
Four, predictability. Five, it's an activity, emotionary. It's one of my favorites. Six, collaborative YouTube playlist. And seven, online classes, practices. Um, I decided to make a special chapter just to give uh, practical hints for teachers who work online. So let's start with the first one, learn your students' names. I started doing this since I started teaching English. I have a long road in language teaching sphere, so I have many things to say about this. And it's something I always felt it was beneficial. As a student, as a high school student, I was treated by a number. I was number 42, 46, average, because my, my name is with the letter T, and there's this alphabetical order. And in the past, teachers used to treat students by their number. Number one, present, in the roll call, right? Number two. And I never liked it. I felt that I was just a number. And when you treat your students by their names, you include their identity you consider and respect them. So when you learn your students' names, students respond better to activities. When you call the student's name, he looks at you instantly. <laughs> students feel valued and appreciated as individuals. And there are these even gender aspects and I respect the name they would like to be called. Students pay more attention in class because it's their name that's being pronounced. And you build a respectful relationship in class. I also play with my students. Sometimes the student is Pedro and I call him Peter or Peter. But I asked them before, would you like me to pronounce your name in English? Some students don't feel comfortable and they say, it's okay, I can call you Pedro. I make them decide if they want me to pronounce their name differently or not. And some of them even ask, what is my name pronounced in English? And sometimes it's just a name that there isn't in English, like Joselia. And I said, oh, Joselia. Yeah, I try to make it <laughs> sound like it's in, pronounced in English just to make them feel happy. But talking about this, some people say that I have a good memory, but I don't have a good memory. I practice. I practice a lot. In fact, I write my students' names. They are here on my notebook. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. But until I learn, I write every class. I teach, now I'm teaching 253 students in eight different groups. And I'm proud to say that I know every student's name. So it's not a matter of good memory. It's not a matter of nothing. I work a lot and I practice a lot. So if you want to have a closer relationship, if you want to have your students pay more attention in you, learn their names and you will benefit from this. Mindfulness practices. I started doing mindfulness practices during the pandemic. And I thought it was it was doing so much good to me that I decided to bring to my classes. And in that time, we were having online classes. That was in 2020, 2021. But then I started to think that it was beneficial for the students and they were giving me this feedback, sometimes even asking to do it in class. Teacher, I don't feel well today. Let's do that mindfulness practice. And so, of course, and I stop my class and do the mindfulness practice. I believe that wellness and social emotional aspects are even more important than the curriculum aspects. Because when you are feeling happy, when you're feeling comfortable with your teacher and with your ambience of your classroom, you learn more. So you learn faster and the teacher work is easier and everybody's happier. The students have better grades. They pay more attention in class. 
So they are less stressful and they sleep better and they have less conflicts in their families. I can list infinite benefits of mindfulness practices. And this is just an example. It's a YouTube video from the channel called Calm. It's an app too, but it's a paid app and it's quite expensive, but there are many free features and I only work with free features. I believe teachers from Turkey also have this uh, exchange currency in relation to the dollar that's really hard for us and in Brazil as well. So I only search and I'm only going to share with you free resources. And this is a very simple video. <laughs> Thank you, Aiden. And it's a very simple video of breathe in, hold, breathe out. And there is a sound that guides this uh, mindfulness breathing because you do with your eyes closed. I turn the lights off in class and we do it for three minutes. I let them, if they want to sit on the floor, or lay down or stay in the best way they want. I don't make them feel set on the chair and stuck like paying attention to me. No, I, I want to make them feel comfortable. And when they are more comfortable, they learn better and they pay more attention in class. <laughs> So this is a more technical aspect of the mindfulness practices. When do I, how often do I do it? In the first class of each month and before the week of tests. I work, as I told you in the beginning, in a, in a technical high school and the students study 17 different subjects. And English is just one. <laughs> so, when they have the week of tests, they have anxiety crisis, they are nervous, stressed, and I sit with them and do a mindfulness practice like that. In the first practices, the students laugh, sometimes they make fun of it. My students are from 16 to 18, 19 years old, so they, they are not used to the silence. It's so interesting when I start doing, when I do with them for the first time, they start laughing because it's silence and somebody makes a little noise and all the class bursts out laughing. <laughs> and I say, it's okay, let's pause, let's try again. And I do it again until they can stay three minutes in silence, consciously breathing. And they start to understand that is beneficial for them. Adaptation will happen naturally. Some groups adapt faster. Some groups that are noisier, they take longer, but it's okay. And you have to be practicing by yourself before you practice with your students. This is something I'm going to mention about other practices, and I guess it's in the end of my presentation. Self-care comes before social emotional practices with your students. So we have to start taking care of ourselves first, of our mental health and our social and emotional practices before we bring this to class. Three, social emotional quote. It's quite simple. This was the quote I used this week, by the way. The greatest wealth is health by philosopher Virgil. And I teach them new vocabulary. I teach, uh, for example, I taught them the difference between wealth and health. And they didn't know. And we had this little discussion about this. And you might be asking, Tiago, how, how do you, where do you get these quotes? Yeah, I use uh, artificial intelligence. And I was going to talk to you about this too. I use artificial intelligence to plan, to help me plan my classes. This visual presentation was taken from a website called SlidesGo. They have also presentations created by artificial intelligence. Many resources are free. 
And this artificial intelligence that I'm going to share with you, it's called Pool. It is a repository of artificial intelligences. So you can find there Gemini, ChatGPT, and the most famous artificial intelligence, as well as other uh, independent bots that create images, create uh, so many resources for your uh, English classes. And I took a print because I typed here, can you see on the screen? Can you give me 30 social emotional fields? And then uh, the assistant gave me the 30 social emotional quotes. I just pick up one of them. I sometimes type, can you give me shorter quotes? You can also adapt your prompt to your necessities. And we can maybe make a, another presentation just about using artificial intelligence in education, either, I think would be so nice. What is the objective of using a quote in the beginning of each class? First of all, connect the lesson with the topic. So it works as a warm up. I'm presenting the quote and telling today we're going to this week. We talked about wellness. One of the aspects of wellness is mental health, emotional health. And then I started the lesson telling them the greatest wealth is health. Elicit discussion with your students, teach new vocabulary, make a self-reflection. There are so many objectives and benefits from using social emotional quotes in your classes. And I also typed here an observation, use AI to help you plan your quotes and your lessons and everything you need with your English classes. Predictability. This is a practice I take to my classes. And when I learned theoretically about it, I realized that I already did. So I was super happy that I found that so many practices I've been doing throughout the years were social and emotional uh, practices. And maybe you teachers that are here with us and who are watching online we might have so many practices that are considered social and emotional practices. This one is called predictability. What is an example of it? I present a lesson agenda every class. So I tell them, today we're going to study about the aspects of wellness. I explain the objective of the lesson every class. By the end of the class, you, you will have to be able to understand what wellness is, explain the four aspects of wellness, and create a wellness goal for this year. This is just an example, right? But something I did this week. But it's also within, related to assessments. So inform test dates in advance, test formats, rubrics so how you are going to correct students work in advance they will feel more comfortable they will produce more they will become they will trust you more so they will help you in class and they will become better students as a result you will have a better atmosphere in class and everybody wins here in Brazil, unfortunately, there are some teachers who still believe that surprise tests or arguations are beneficial for the students. And I have to talk a little about this. Oh, these two benefits from predictability. Predictability makes students feel more comfortable in class make them feel aware of their learning expectations, make them feel more conf confident to participate in activities, in control of their routine and learning outcomes. So there are so many benefits to let your students know what you are going to do. And it's so simple. It takes 10 seconds, 30 seconds of your class. <laughs> 
So it's something that's really impactful. There is no pedagogical theory that supports that surprise tests and arguations. This is a this this is viewed as a punishment for the student. And it's so unfair because the students don't have control over the assessment. And when you don't discuss assessments with them and just bring the tests and throw the tests at them, they feel anxiety symptoms. They feel incapable of having good grades. They feel stressed and upset, even about going to school. This may cause a student to drop off school. And they can also develop low self-esteem. None of this is beneficial for the students. So I would like to bring this reflection here and make teachers think that this practice is no longer acceptable. Now I'm going to talk about the fifth activity. If I'm going too fast, you can let me know, but I'm taking control of the time here with a timer. <laughs> um, the motion area is one of my favorite activities, and it's super simple. I adapted this activity from a website. I can't recall. I search a lot of websites for ESL activities online, and I adapted personally to my taste and to my students context. As you can see, these are WhatsApp emojis, <laughs> but I'm going to let you know how I came to this. First of all, I start by the class, of course, with a social emotional quote. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I ask students to mention any emotion, uh, any emotion words they know when I write on the board, it's a brainstorming. You can do this also using Mentimeter. You can talk about this. And I know some digital uh, tools that are free to use that are really cool to do with your students in class. And then I play a video that presents new vocabulary, which is uh, related to emotion words and images. There are many videos on YouTube that are available for you to do that. And then I ask students to say the words presented in the video. So it's a recall practice. And I write the words on the board. And then I give them this chart. I give them an emotionary chart with the WhatsApp emojis. They love it when they see it. <laughs> And I ask them to write an emotion under each emoji. It's, it surprises me that students have different answers for each emoji. <laughs> and sometimes they are, they bring the most curious definitions. <laughs> this melted face, there are so many definitions for it. <laughs> and some of them here in Brazil are used when you are embarrassed or if you are being ironic, or if you are making fun, or in this case you are mad, or and they they come up with the most interesting adjectives to describe these emojis, and we have a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> so. Now it's the sequence of the lesson. It's a step-by-step, -step, right? Students discuss in pairs about their chart. I allow them 10 minutes average. I forgot to mention, but my lessons are 100 minutes long here. So it's a, it's a great time for me to work with them. Yeah. Um, you can also make a group discussion about the emojis. So you project the emojis on the board and say, well, how about this one? And they start, elicit, you start eliciting participation from them. Ask students to, in, and then after you finish this emoji discussion, you ask students to individually write three sentences following the structure. I feel dash 
when dash. And then they are going to use an emotion and a situation. So we start talking about the emotions, right? Naming emotions. Uh, and then, of course, I give them a positive example when I talk to them. I say, I feel energetic when I'm in the English class. I feel happy when I'm with my students. I feel great when I go to work. But they come up with some, of course, sometimes they create funny sentences just to make fun. <laughs> But sometimes they reveal aspects of their sadness, of something that's happening in their lives, and they didn't have the words to say. And sometimes they come to me after class and say, teacher, thank you. I'm starting to understand what I'm feeling when that situation occurs. If they don't have the English knowledge that's advanced enough to produce these kinds of sentences, I even allow them to write in Portuguese. Because in this case, more importantly than bringing the English knowledge to this specific sentence, I prefer them to reflect about their feelings the way they can. So some students create their sentences in Portuguese and I embrace them. I translate for them. I help them with what they need. And if they want to create in Portuguese, um, I allow them to do so. And then I tell them to discuss these sentences in small groups. I make a group discussion about their sentences and an overall review reflection about the class. I ask them, how do you feel about this class? I do this every class. It's called accountability. And I always ask them for feedback in the end of each class. If students don't want to share their sentences because they were too personal or emotional, I respect them and leave them with their own sentences without forcing this kind of participation. Normally, they participate really well and have fun, but there is one case of another of a student that reveals something that was inside and he or she wasn't able to express. We're coming to an end. This is activity number six, the collaborative YouTube playlist. I love music. I learned English with music, and music is a great part of my life. So I bring this to my English classes. In the beginning of each school year, I tell my students, look, I love music. I learned English with music. But here, it's not going to be about my music. It has to be about your music. Because <laughs> if I play my music here, nobody will enjoy it. <laughs> and what do I do to get this? I create a collaborative YouTube playlist, share the link with them, and they include the songs they like. And then I pick up a song from their preferences to use in my classes. They are super excited about this. You see their names here, Monique? I've added so many songs. <laughs> I start with one song. I'm going to describe this practice now in detail um, and tell you how it works exactly. I learned English with music, so I bring many activities with music to my lessons. So what is the procedure? I create a playlist with only one song. I make the playlist collaborative in the settings button. Then I create a QR code with the playlist link. There are different QR code generators online. We can talk about this later, of course. Then I explain the objective of the playlist to my students, that is to work with their music in class. I share the QR code in class and ask them to add songs they would like to study in the English class. They are thrilled. They become crazy when I do it. They, oh, I've got to put all my songs, and they put all their songs. Sometimes they put songs in Portuguese, and then I just ignore them. But 
most of them put songs in English and songs that are really cool to work in class. There are more procedures here for me to share with you. So I create one playlist for each group I teach. That's hard work, right? <laughs> I teach 200, more than 250 students and they're all adding songs in different playlists. And I'm uh, curating all these playlists. So as I love music, it's not too much work for me. Nowadays, I teach eight groups. So there are eight different playlists, one for each class. Before working the songs with them, I curate the songs. What is it? I watch out for bad language or explicit videos. And then I remove these videos from the playlist. It's their favorite songs, but some songs are not appropriate for an English class, right? <laughs> I choose a song and create a music activity with it. It's simple, fill in the blanks, the most simple activity. They will love it because it's their music. <laughs> I bring it to class always as a surprise, but I was just talking about predictability <laughs> and not talking about surprise. <laughs> Can you decide, Tiago? No, wait, this is a good surprise. This is something they will love. Like when I bring chocolate to class, I don't bring chocolate every class, but when I bring it, it's a surprise and they love it. And there's an alternative for this practice. I do a karaoke class after the test week for them as a relaxation moment at the end of a period or at a special date. Maybe some, it's someone's birthday and they say, oh, please teacher, do the karaoke lesson. And if I'm okay with my planning, with my lessons, I say, yeah, let's do it, why not? And then I turn the sound system on and we have a lot of fun. They get crazy when we do the karaoke lessons. And they really sing and join Brazilian. And I believe students from Turkey are also super excited and motivated, like full of energy, and they want to speak and they want to uh, join the class, especially when there's something that is interesting for them. So my students are just like this. When they say, next class is karaoke, everybody comes to class. <laughs> so it's super nice. Some, uh, some, uh, there was a, a one last year I did in the school cafeteria and everybody was involved. It was so cool. I even called some teachers to sing along. We had so much fun. Now, I'm going to share my final uh, practices. Number seven, online classes practices. It's just a few hints for you to engage your students, to make them feel motivated, considered, respected in class. The activities I explained before can be adapted to virtual classes as well. If you need help, email me and we can work on this together. It will be a pleasure for me to help you out with that. Let me tell you what I thought about online practices. Before class, let students know that you will ask them to turn their cameras on. So it's a matter of privacy. Sometimes they are not dressed appropriately or they're not in the uh, best space to study or they are in this case here in Brazil West, most of them are underprivileged. They are even shy to show their homes or embarrassed to show the place they study. If they don't feel comfortable, I leave them with their cameras off and it's okay. But I believe that when the students are with their cameras on, students focus more on the lesson and the teacher notices better how the lesson is going with the nonverbal responses. We were just mentioning this in the beginning of the presentation, Dr. Aida. You were nodding and I can see and you were smiling and I can feel you were following the presentation. And if the student is like this with a face of doubt or with another facial expression, you can just help them out without them even saying a word. 
five minutes before the online class, I play a live show on YouTube. You, you know, I, I feel totally connected with music. So I encourage students to enter the virtual class to watch it. What is the consequence of this practice? Students arrive on time in class and you raise the energy level before the class begins. So they arrive earlier to watch the show and they are with their energy up. You play the songs they like. You can even use songs from their collaborative playlist and then you connect both ideas and you bring a great energy level to your class. Um, I also encourage students' participation, giving them virtual chocolates. I was shy to mention this, but it's, it works, believe me. <laughs> Sometimes I elicit participation, everybody's quiet, there with their cameras off, and I said, come on guys, I have some virtual chocolates for you. And a student makes a participation, and I celebrate, like, hey, congratulations, here's your virtual chocolate, and I put an emoji of this chocolate. <laughs> And they laugh and they start participating just to get the virtual chocolates. And it's just a way of making them feel more relaxed. I also tell them, I forgot to mention in this presentation, that the English class is a non-judgment zone. So they can pronounce the way they think it's okay. They can try with the words they know and nobody will judge them. We will work on improvement, of course. We will try to extract the best out of them. But if what they have in this moment is just a little, we will reinforce that and make them feel good about this. Also, work on your voice level and tone to make students participate and focus on the lesson. If you have a more energetic voice and you raise your voice to make them feel more aware about the class, this impacts positively also in your virtual classes. And show appreciation and give support to students who participate, giving them virtual chocolates and authentic feedback. Sometimes we are just focused on saying, oh, very good. Okay, very good. Very nice. Congratulations. Excellent. Okay. No, I, I give them authentic feedback saying, I liked the way you pronounced it. You had a very good intonation. Maybe we can work more on that uh, stressed syllable. How about that? Would you like to practice after me? And then I pronounce and he or she repeats. So if you give them authentic feedback, they feel you are really paying attention to what they are saying and that you care about their learning. Final thoughts. <laughs> Thumbs up. Social emotional learning is essential, not only in English lessons, but in all school environments. I have just mentioned there are 17 subjects here for my students, and I'm just one. But I believe that with my work, other teachers might join in. I'm working specifically on this at this moment, creating a wellness commission in my campus. So sharing these ideas with other teachers and encouraging them to include in their classes. Self-care comes before social and emotional practices with your students. I cannot be stressed in school and start by let's do a meditation practice. I can't do this because I don't do it at home. I'm stressed. I don't like what I do. So you have first to take care of yourself to start taking care of others. Third one, it's nothing special. You might have already been doing social and emotional practices in your class and not even noticing. That's what I was doing before I traveled to the United States, before I met the amazing work of Dr. Javier Herrera and Dr. Hilda Martinez Alba. So I realized that I was already doing this. I just didn't know how to connect this with the theoretical background. Now, I would like to know from you in the chat box, 
what was the most interesting practice in your opinion? There were too many. Maybe you don't remember. There were seven practices, but is there any practice that caught most your attention? Some people were saying we're talking about the 100 minute class. <laughs> yeah, I have to plan a lot of things and change changing activities for them to be focused. Oh, indeed. Uh, thank you. YouTube music. Uh, thank you. It's really cool. It's one of my favorites. Absolutely. YouTube playlist, the emoji one. I can share all of them with you. I can exchange mails with Dr. Aiden and she can email you also, or I can email you directly. YouTube music, uh, breathing in silence. I love it. I do it every night. It helps me sleep. Now, how do you feel after, after this presentation? <laughs> Can you tell me with one word how you feel after this um, sharing? <laughs> ah, there was one more comment. I liked the more the mindfulness one. It's amazing. It does miracles for us in class. Oh, Vulcan is here, Vulcan, my friend. Great webinar, Chuck. Thank you. Oh, Svetlana, it's my teacher, colleague teacher from uh, Ukraine. Not the visuals. Uh, thank you, creative ideas. Thank you so much. Well, this is my content. Thank you so much. My email is thiago.macena at ifal.edu.br and my LinkedIn is Vasti. That's my middle name and my the three first letters of my name. Thank you so much, Dr. Aiden, and everyone that is present. Well. Thank you, in fact, for this wonderful presentation. It was fascinating. I didn't want it to end, so <laughs> I didn't warn you about the time. I wanted you to go on and on because, uh, of course, when knowing about the theory is wonderful, but seeing how uh, practical ideas can be used in the classroom situation, that makes it uh real it becomes real because theory is not meaningful all the time especially if you're a classroom teacher if you're not an academic you don't want to deal with theory i do appreciate this presentation thank you very much great ideas i have taken some notes uh and i will definitely use them uh, with university students uh who Thanks are like Adult babies, we call them. <laughs> I they hear are you. Babies in adult bodies. Amazing. Uh, dear colleagues, if you have any questions or comments, uh, you can raise their hand or use the chat box, you know, uh, to just to give you some time to think whether you have anything that you want to ask. I will ask the first question if it's okay with you. Yes. Um, by the way, Tiago, I really didn't like your virtual chocolates. I want my chocolates real, not virtual <laughs> ones. <laughs> oh, you made me nervous. Real, real <laughs> chocolate, please. Uh, yeah. Just kidding, of course. Now, in your experience, of course, I don't know whether you have told uh international students or not have you noticed that the cultural background of the students interfere 
negatively influence their expression of their emotions. Yes, absolutely. And especially the relationship they had with their previous teachers. I mean, with talking about adult students. Mm. I already worked in a campus that was undergraduate students and they were even language students they were going to become english and portuguese teachers oh, so it was okay. a job i really liked because mm. i was teaching people who were going to follow my profession mm. and they were, and many of them came with issues that were a res uh, in their teaching practices that were a result of what teachers did to them mm. so trying to take control of the class like speaking loud or screaming at the students or using a rude rude expressions or not listening to what the students had to say and little by little i was talking to them and trying to explain them with my example that i was also a victim of violent language in school from my teachers but that doesn't make me reproduce this on my students. Mm -hmm. It's hard, mm -hmm. but we have to be the breaking point. And we have to start a new generation of teachers who are welcoming, who are kind, who speak in a calm voice and make mm -hmm. them feel belonging to the school environment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they have accepted what you said? Do you think that they are are ready to change become some of uh, them. yeah okay well Not some all of them. most yeah. probably will show some resistance yes and they say no i have even colleagues here i'm going to speak in a low voice because i'm in my workplace okay <laughs> but it's okay it's not there we are different as people and everybody has their stage of growing emotionally and creating new uh, ways to teach and to relate with the students. So sometimes mm. the teacher believes that he is an authority in the class and everybody has to obey what he's saying. Mm. One person is speaking and 45 people are silent, sitting mm. in line, listening to that person. That's not mm. the pedagogy I believe. I believe in dialogue, yes. in sharing, in learning from them as they learn from me. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I really wanted to uh make this comment but i i wanted to put it in a question form because i do not know whether this is specific to our culture or other countries also suffer from this i'm going to call it a disease you know people maybe because they have some self-esteem issues i don't know or maybe they have some other mental issues God knows, I'm not an expert in that field, but they have this very hostile uh, attitude towards their students. They they see students as not their uh, friends or family or human beings, but like their enemies. Even the remarks that they make is amazing how can you do this profession if you don't like it i never understand yes. that and the yes. way you talk is this how you teach in the classroom is this the tone that you use yes <laughs> that's even a very when... calming tone <laughs> very even calming when... you know yeah. it's, it's not stressing it's very calming giving a kind of a safe feeling to people uh, I totally believe that we do definitely need to change things I mean we yes. cannot we, we cannot establish anything if we stick to our old and bad habits right 
Sure. And, yeah. and sometimes here in Brazil, this happens also, Dr. Aydan. Uh, their itching is related to oppression. So mm. they have to stay quiet. They have to obey. They have to behave. What is behave? To stay in silence without even touching their phones with the focus on that person? So it, sometimes I work with uh, noisy classes and they are talking and there's a lot of noise in class and a student screams like, shut up, very loud. And I say, no, no, worry, please don't do this. Don't do this. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We can manage this. And I approach the student who's making the noise and I ask them, please, let's, let's start the lesson. Let's settle down. And I go to the other, hey, please, let's let's start the lesson. And then they respect. And then I start teaching them that respect is gained, is not imposed. I always tell them this. Guys, I'm never going to scream at you. I will talk in a low voice and you will follow my lead. Is it okay? And they are they are responding. It takes more time. It's faster to scream, to be aggressive. But the results of talking to them in a calm voice are uh, much better, much better, I can mm. tell. I don't think that uh, negative behavior creates any positive results. If you shout at them, if you uh, scold them, if you show negative reactions to your students, I don't think that they're going to respect you. Most probably they're going to make fun of you when you yes. turn your back. I would Absolutely. do that. Absolutely. I would do that, definitely. <laughs> We're all yeah. human beings. We don't like to be patronized. We don't want to be looked down upon. We want to be respected as being humans. Nothing else, right? Uh, so I think this is something that we need to remember. Uh, whatever reaction we want to get, should be the reaction that we give, right? So if you want to have respect from our students, we need to first respect our students. Otherwise, I mean, this is a two-way street. It's not, uh, you're going to respect me, but I can do whatever I want to. Uh, then you become a dictator. <laughs> you, exactly. don't become, <laughs> you don't become a teacher. Well, exactly. uh, I'm I'm just taking my time just to give my participants some time to come up with their questions or comments, but they keep complimenting, uh, <laughs> saying very positive things in the chat box. Thank you. <laughs> you you're spoiling us. Thank you very much. <laughs> there are even compliments about the Brazilian national team. Thank you yes. very much. <laughs> Uh, um, so well, nice. I guess uh, there are no questions. So what I can do is I, I can just thank you very much again from the bottom of my heart for this wonderful topic and wonderful presentation. And I wish you all the best uh, with your brilliant works. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I believe we have so many things in common. Turkey and Brazil are like brothers and sisters. Oh, it's yes. so amazing how we look like. <laughs> <laughs> and you should definitely come here. You are totally welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it, the same goes for you. You're always <laughs> welcome uh here uh unfortunately our association is a very poor one so <laughs> we cannot invite anyone using our budget but if you come here you will experience turkish hospitality uh, yeah. so uh, a wonderful you. turkish cuisine so, yes, if i were you i wouldn't miss that chance <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess uh, I have a friend to, to crash yes. on his couch. Maybe I will crash on Vulcan's couch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you are more than welcome, of course. You're our friend, you're our colleague, <laughs> and you're a teacher that we all respect because Thank you're you. a wonderful teacher. And I Thank hope you. you will become a, a model for young teachers. Uh, so thank you again.
And as usual, my dear colleagues, thank you very much for being here, being with us, sharing these wonderful ideas with us, meetings, sessions, whatever you call them. It's a pleasure to spend my Friday evenings with you. Uh, and I hope to see you next week. This time, yeah. we're not going to have a guest. You will have me as the speaker. <laughs> And I will find a moderator. Azra Hocam, is there something <laughs> that you would like to say? I just have a chair. Oh, God. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have been the moderator for some time now. I will be the speaker, the moderator at the same time. I hope to see you next week. Stay safe. Take good care of yourselves. You're all wonderful people. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a great Bye -bye. night. Thank great you. Great to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.